This episode of the My Latin Life podcast is brought to you by Language Blend, the new best way to learn Spanish. Language Blend focuses on what you actually need to live and get by abroad with daily one-on-one lessons, a dedicated texting partner. It's like living in a Spanish-speaking country without ever leaving home. Go to languageblend.com for more information. Dude, I just got a quote for a mortgage from one of these wonderful tax disruptors. And it was at, I think, 15%, maybe 14 and a half. It, it's just painful. It's, it's insane. And um, as a result, I mean, here in Mexico, I think 16% of the population who owns a home has a mortgage. That's the last stat I saw. It, it's insanely low. People here are, are very used to paying cash and avoiding those, those interests as they become very difficult to deal with over time. Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. My guest today is Joe Marulo, CEO of Arenda, a Mexico City-based startup. Joe, how's it going, man? It's good, man. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. Calling in from Mexico City today, right? I am. Right outside of Condesa today. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Um, yeah, I guess the best way to start off the episode is we'd love to just hear more about your background and then how you came to start this startup called Arenda or Arenda with a double Very R. Good. Very good. You got me. It's unfortunately something I can't even do. Uh, I never thought I'd found a company, which I can't pronounce the name of, but here we are. Um, myself, I'm originally from the suburbs of Boston, grew up in a small town called Sudbury, um, and moved into the commercial real estate space in Boston. I was around 19, 20 years old, did that for about five, six years, worked uh, doing like CRE underwriting, looking at hospitality, multifamily, eventually jumped ship to a startup, leading their expansion efforts out of New York. It's called June, focused on co-living. Did that for a couple of years, ended up in San Francisco during the pandemic. Uh, that collapsed very quickly. It was a very dangerous place to live and unsightly during those days, decided to move down to, to Mexico for a little bit. What was planned to be a, a two-week trip turned into a, a three-year or, ordeal, and here we are calling in from the lovely country itself today. So happy to be here and, and happy to have had the opportunity to do this uh, remote work and eventual migration. Nice. I love it. And so the, co- the co-working business or the co-living business that you were involved in, that was in the States? That was before you even kind of went digital nomad? Yeah, exactly. I kind of had like a soft a soft landing into the lifestyle um, before eventually was, you know, kind of forming roots here in Mexico. Um, I led the expansion of this company that was focused on co-living uh, out of New York into Boston, eventually into DC, LA, and then San Francisco. So I had the opportunity to kind of do a little bit of nomadism in the US before going uh, full haul into Latin America. But it was fantastic. They were uh, a rocket ship company. I joined them at the pre-seed stage. I was employee number eight, I believe, uh, and grew that up into the Series B, led by SoftBank. Just an absolute amazing growth trajectory. Uh, really impressive folks there, and they're still kicking around today. Okay, sweet. And then taking us up to today, and by the way, I love the the birds in the background, common theme in uh, interviews in Latin America. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, Tell us what Arenda is exactly. Arenda is a company which provides liquidity to illiquid industries. Um, Our primary focus is in the real estate market. Uh, We're now looking at expansion into the the B2B side, looking to work with software companies to help help improve their their growth trajectories without having to expose themselves to equity dilution. So what we effectively do is take long dated receivables that are highly liquid but secure and provide financing against those. Uh, sort of like factoring, but on a longer term, a longer term basis. Um, so today we work with residential and commercial property owners throughout Mexico, providing credit facilities up to 500,000 USD, securitized through the, the leasing contracts that underlie the property. Okay. I wasn't ready to put my, my finance hat on so fast. Um, 
but you like the the company also does something involving like rent payments or something like that like it, it it's kind of um focused towards the local latin american market like your your clients are are like local mexicans and stuff yeah so all of our clients are here in mexico um we work with landlords of properties so people who take rent payments on a monthly basis and give them financing against those rent payments that they're going to collect in the future uh, so we enable them to access financing with that as collateral uh, and again uh, here in mexico we're now in eight different states looking to hit full expansion throughout the country in the next 12 months uh, it's been a fun ride okay so you're basically fronting landlords against their uh, future receivables in the term of rent payments. Exactly. Okay. Does this model exist in the States as well? Yeah, we've seen a couple of people do it in the States, um, albeit mostly limited towards the residential sector. Uh, there are some amazing companies, uh, Steady Technologies, which has raised a, a massive amount of capital for this. And then a couple of newer players, um, blanking on their names. They're so new. I just saw them for the first time, but uh, it is something which is gaining more popularity. Mm -hmm. We've seen the model across the world in, in some select markets, um, London, Spain, India, the US. So starting to gain more popularity. Ourselves at Arenda, we're, we're kind of leading the charge for it here in Latin America, but uh, really grateful to have the opportunity to do so and are seeing great results so far. So excited to see where we'll end. Yeah, this is interesting because the U.S. seems to have never historically sort of fin financialized a rental agreement in that way before. And the U.S. is like the king of financializing everything. What do you think was, was there some sort of legal obstacle to this or some reason that future rent payments were not considered a uh, valid collateral in the past? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, for the majority of the public, there's no way to capitalize on that as collateral. Um, in turn, I believe the main driver is due to efficiency. It's very easy to get credit, whether collateralized or uncollateralized through a different sort of asset or, or banking partner uh, who may do it uncollateralized. Um, there's never been a, a true need to be this creative with achieving access. So as a result, I don't, I don't think it's ever been a, a very strong lever to pull. Uh, that being said, we're starting to see companies offer it against Steady. I believe it's five years old now. They're kind of pioneering that for the multifamily sector out in the U.S. And uh, it seems to be that they're, they're achieving attractive returns. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, yeah, it's, so kind of what you're saying, if I had to um, reinterpret that, is you're saying because in the U.S. it's so easy to access capital by uh, for real estate developers and landlords through um, through the equity in the building that there was no reason to look anywhere else other than the equity of the building. But because in Latin America, it's like harder to get mortgages and harder to, you know, financialize or borrow against the equity in your building. In, in some ways, it's easier to borrow against the, the rent payments you have come in. Yeah, more or less. I mean, even if we look outside of using real estate as collateral, you're likely very able to access capital in the United States, even if it's on a personal level for what you need to accomplish. Unless you're looking at some sort of massive line of, of financing that you need and you have decent credit and, and access, you, you're not really facing the same challenge as people in Latin America do. The Latin American capital markets are extremely inefficient and extremely difficult to work with on that sense. Um, there's no usury cap here in New Mexico and in many other countries. And as a result, financing is extremely expensive and, awesome, and often very, very time consuming to access. So having these alternative products that have been delivered through fintechs have presented attractive options for people to access capital, which otherwise would not be available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so your clients are the, the building owners and like owners of property? Exactly. And so how are you, how are you finding... Uh... Your, your go to market in terms of, you know, getting in contact with uh, real estate owners and land owners in Latin America and saying, hey, we'll give you cash against your future rentals. We have a, a blended distribution strategy here at Arenda. We work through traditional digital distribution. We have a lovely platform which enables access to uh, the credit facilities and the products we offer in a completely 100% digital fashion. So you can go on 
register, apply, and then get funded very quickly. Um, but we also distribute pretty heavily through partnerships. We work with various different types of folks in the industry, whether real estate agents, credit agents, uh, mortgage companies, on a referral-based partnership system in which we're exchanging contacts and driving business through through this, this form. Um, the latter has been the most popular for us, working in this B2B2B, B2B2C fashion has been very efficient and as a result has enabled us to expand very quickly in the country. Uh, we're coming up on uh, 2 million USD originated in our first six months of operations and couldn't be happier. That's awesome. And what does is, what is originated mean? Uh, like credits distributed. So uh, financing's originated, uh, money's lent. Okay. That's, yeah, that's awesome. I, I did see a, a tweet just from three days ago where you said, and I quote, we launched a wait list for a new product at Arenda two weeks ago. It's reached three million in qualified net revenue with uh, greater than a th- less than a thousand in marketing spend. Should we release it? Do you want to tell us about this? For sure, man. Super excited for this new product we're working on. We've taken the same structure we've built for the commercial real estate market, residential real estate market, with least receivable financing, and applied it towards business receivables. So long dated contract revenue stemming from SaaS companies, membership companies, services companies. Uh, and our wait list is just absolutely blown up. We passed 13 million uh, in financing requests today, which yeah, equates to roughly three to four million in revenue. Um, it's just a fantastic sign for us. So we're very excited about future here at Arenda, looking at a number of financing products similar to this in which we can access, sorry, increase the access to liquidity and capital for businesses that may be in need. Um, so looking generally to build out what kind of looks like pipe for Latin America down here, trying to create an exchange of recurring revenue and access to high yield receivables for debt investors. Um, yeah, it's been a fun ride, man. We're about a year and a half into the business now and going to be happier. Uh, so you're the co-founder, I believe, or a co-founder. Who are your other co-founders? I'm actually a solo founder. So I'm, I'm a crazy gringo who moved to Mexico and launched a business. Um, it's been a, it's been a crazy ride from arriving here, not speaking Spanish, paying five, 600 pesos for every five minute taxi I had to launching a company and um, you know, joining the FinTech revolution. It's uh, been something I've, I would never had expected I've had done. If you had asked me five years ago, if I'd be in Mexico now, certainly wouldn't have had this as an answer, but sure enough, here we are. Okay. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that. Like how, how did you uh, decide upon Mexico city and uh, did the, did you move to Mexico City specifically to start this business or the idea kind of came to you a bit later? And I know you were part of Latitude, which is kind of like an accelerator program. Maybe tell us how that kind of fit into things. When I first came here to Mexico, I came to Tulum, just like every other digital nomad in the world. Um, it was a great place for, for starting out. Really beautiful place, friendly people, great culture, super relaxed environment. Uh, but of course, after a couple of months of enjoying the sun and all of that, you, you get a little bored. So I ended up in Mexico City one day, uh, back towards, I believe it was October of 2020. And I remember walking down Avenida de Reforma and thinking, damn, there is serious energy to this place. There's something happening here. People are walking around like they're in New York. There's direction to everything. I need to learn more about this, this business uh, ecosystem here and, and what's going on and Oh, started to dive in, um, really became enthralled with the idea of coming here and doing something. I didn't know what it was yet and um, started to move in that direction. So I went back to the U.S., got residency figured out, came back in March of 21 uh, with a, a C-Corp Incorporated. No clear idea of what it would be, but um, knowing that I wanted to do something here and went off to the races and, and looked for issues and eventually dug into what we're doing today. Okay. You set up a, your corp in March of 2021. So just over two years ago. So it was actually in January. I incorporated. I knew I was going to launch a business. I had the itch to do something. Um, my plan at that time was to go jump into this ecosystem that I was becoming obsessed with and find problems, find what was difficult for people. And sure enough, um, you know, through some personal experiences, trying to rent and then understanding how messed up capital markets here are uh, in comparison to the U.S. and, and more efficient markets uh, ended up with the idea for Renda. 
And I think just coming back to what you said before, rent payments are just the starting point and you're, and you're actually looking to do, to lend against uh, SaaS payments and, and other future accounts receivable, right? Not just rent. Yeah, exactly. The overall vision is to really lead the, the charge of access to liquidity for these businesses, which are dealing with long dated receivables where otherwise they can't access capital or if they can, it's extremely expensive, predatory. So bringing forward a fair financing option to people who are in these types of business lines. So businesses such as real estate, SaaS, subscription, royalty based, anything of this nature we're looking to tap into. This is so cool because um, a lot of digital nomads or, or expats in Latin America, they're not involved in the local economy at all. And it sounds like you went down with the idea to, to get involved. And here you are just a, a relatively short amount of time later, a year, one, two years later. And you already have, uh, I think you've raised money. You got wait lists, you got customers, you've origin, you've provided over $2 million of loans to businesses, uh, in Latin America. So already making a difference. Hats off to you. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, we did our first equity round last year. Um, we did 1.6 million and then a $25 million debt facility to, help propel the loans that we're giving. Um, most of the employees are Mexicans. I'm the only gringo right now. So slowly start to uh, embed myself into the culture a bit more, uh, learning Spanish and starting to really fall in love with the place. But it's, it's been a great opportunity and really love being able to contribute towards the growth of this country. It's, um, it's a beautiful place with amazing people and couldn't be happier to be here doing this. Yeah. And so how sophisticated the team? Do you Are you hiring... Like what type of employees are you hiring? Are you trying to get like ex bankers uh, who really understand business loans and, and sort of poach people from the banks type stuff? Or uh, what level of financial sophistication is, is needed here? I think it's important to note that what we're building primarily is a technology product, a technology company. We're building the exchange that sits between debt investors and receivable owners to empower the access of capital at scale. Um, we've done the majority of the financial engineering and legwork ourselves to date, given that we needed to prove that this market exists to the, the degree we believe it does, that we're able to capitalize the receivables the way we think they would, which is why we raised that debt. Um, but if you look at the team composition, the majority of the professionals are technology players, product designers, uh, front end, back end, full stack, data scientists, things of this nature. The financial core does exist, and I have poached to top uh, executives from non-bank lending companies, uh, so FOMS here in Mexico. Uh, but the main focus is, is that tech layer and building on strong technical products that can scale across the region. Our vision is to start in Mexico, but to expand throughout other ecosystems which face these systemic liquidity issues from Colombia to Brazil, uh, Peru, Ecuador, maybe one day Argentina if we can figure out the currency. Um, but there's really some some serious thought behind how do we get this out of the gates and in the millions, uh, not just not just Mexicans. So are you you're lending in the local currency then? I assume. Yeah, yeah, we've uh, we've raised in dollars. We hedge into pesos. Um, I think that's pretty traditional for when you look at what most fintechs who are lending capital do here. Uh, most of the players who are going to do significant debt facilities are going to be out of the out of the country, if not out of the region. Um, so for example, we raised out of London. A lot of players are doing the same, if not going to the United States, uh, working with those traditional debt private capital funds. Okay, cool. So you raised in the States? Yeah, we raised from London, the States and Mexico. So a little bit of representation from all. Uh, we've taken capital from funds, uh, Fasanara Capital based in London, who led the round, uh, then into the US, Lightspeed, uh, venture partners, Warden FinTech Angels, number of founders from very successful prop tech and FinTech companies in the States, and then uh, local micro VCs, and even some money in Dubai now that I think about it with, with Cube Ventures. Um, so a little, a little bit from everywhere. We've, we've got a global perspective backing us and driving us forward as we continue to grow. And so uh, let's talk about like the fundraising and stuff like that just a little bit more. So how, how did you find uh, kind of the appetite for international companies or startups kind of operating in Mexico right now? 
the way I found it when I raised our first round and the way I find it now are, are notably different. Um, of, of course, back in 2020, 2021, the ecosystem was at a, an all-time high as zero interest rate phenomena uh, surpassed us. Uh, people were deploying capital like crazy. Money was being you know, manufactured at a, a very, very high rate. Um, those days have gone. And the overall sentiment towards many venture backable companies has certainly changed. So uh, we're seeing the market react very differently to macroeconomic policy now. Um, things are, are certainly moving a lot slower. Fundraising is taking a lot longer for very many companies with the small exceptions to the AI, ML space and all of that. Um, things have you know, more or less dropped off a cliff uh, from all of the data we've seen. But you know, I still have faith that strong companies and strong founders will remain resilient and, and find a way to get to the next stage. And I'm sure we'll see amazing companies minted from this vintage. And how do you how do you kind of position it when you when you talk to investors? Do you say that you're kind of like a dual U.S. Mexican company, or do you say you're kind of a Mexican company operating or a U.S. company operating in Mexico? Or how do you kind of talk about these international companies in a language that makes sense to venture capitalists and to American asset allocators? That's a great question. Um, for those that are looking at building a startup in Latin America, you should know that if you decide to go down this venture pathway and try to build a category defining or changing company, that there's some pretty standard stuff that, ven that VCs, venture investors are going to expect you to have set up and, and understand. And one of those is incorporation and, and kind of like how the business is being run at a, at a larger scale. Um, Companies who are working in Latin America and expect to raise capital from venture investors, whether they be local or, or abroad, need to have a foreign uh, incorporation structure. The most common that we've seen uh, and coined, I believe, by the Latitude guys or someone close to them is, is the Cayman Sandwich, which would be having a, a master entity, parent company, if you're not. Uh, in the Cayman Islands, which would then own a Delaware LLC, which would then own your local operating company. Um, so we see many variations of this. This is typically the more favorable from what I understand. Um, but we see some others as well with just Delaware LLCs owning uh, local operating companies with the expectations to expand into the Caymans. Sometimes we do see Delaware C Corps operating and owning local opcos. Um, so there's a bit of bit of flavor there. Um, but generally speaking, when you're going out and talking to VCs and angel investors and looking to raise capital, um, you are doing so with roots tied to the U.S. or Caymans, which would own own that U.S. entity. Um, does that make sense? I'm happy to dive deeper and explain that if needed. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the idea is that in every country that you expand to, you operate sort of, or you, you open kind of like a branch office or a branch company that's owned by the U.S. company? Yeah. And everything I'm saying, of course, is not legal advice. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I, I very well could be wrong. Uh, this is all just what I've been told from our lawyers and our friends here. Um, but generally speaking, you have your, your operating company set up per region, um, per vertical, whatever you may have. Um, and then, of course, your venture dollars are going into the U.S. entity um, which is then owned by, by the Caymans. Um, so it's a bit of a standard, standard overhaul. If anyone wants more data on that, I would suggest you to Google Cayman sandwich, uh, maybe Cayman Tostada is another <laughs> I've heard recently. I, I believe Cayman Tostada was coined by Latitude now that I think about it. The Cayman sandwich is, I think, more, more general, but uh, there's, there's certainly a lot of talk and, and chatter on those topics. Today's episode is sponsored by BitRefill. BitRefill allows you to shop online and in person without banks, converting your crypto directly into merchant balance. 
It offers more than 10,000 gift card options in 180 countries. We're talking gift cards to Nike, Amazon, Apple, Airbnb, Hotels.com, all paid for with crypto. And the best part is this is not just in the USA and Canada, but all across the world and all across Latin America. With gift card options in Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, El Salvador, and many more. You can also apply the code MyLatinLife at checkout to get 10% Bitcoin back into that BitRefill account for your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. It's okay. I'll I'll uh I'll save you here and we can we can switch up the topic cuz uh people are going to have to do their own uh research on that. Um I wanted to ask a bit more about latitude. I'm trying to think if you're the first person we've had on that that's been kind of involved with latitude. I want to say Ryan Croft was involved with Lat- was involved with it too. And a, a lot of people I see that have some um a lot of the kind of the big names you'll see in Latin American VC and startup ecosystem are involved with Latitude in some way. Do you want to explain to the audience kind of what Latitude is? Latitude is amazing. Um, Latitude is everything you could ask for and more as an early stage entrepreneur looking to get started in Latin America. It is a community of amazing people, either later stage operators, mentors, if you will, or founders themselves building, which uh, provides advice, strategy, support for you as you grow your business throughout uh, throughout the region. Um, I joined Latitude in the early days back in the summer, fall of 2022, I believe. Um, I was able to jump in uh, before they uh, started their their next wave of growth, which now looks like financial services products. Very interesting. That's a whole nother thing. Uh, but I've been a happy member ever since. Um, I strongly suggest anyone looking at getting into Latin America to check out Latitude. Uh, it's kind of a, a a magic key, if you will, to the, the ecosystem, the players, the founders, the investors. It's uh, it's a great it's a great aid in the toolkit. And did you have to apply and get accepted? Yeah, yeah, you, you you did in the past. Um, the reason I mentioned that you know they, they just had a kind of a change, a pivot of sorts, is that their community program now is a little bit different. I'm not entirely sure what the steps are to enter now, but I believe it's possibly invite only. Uh, they, they may have moved uh, the strategy a little differently from when I when I was there, um, but nonetheless. If anyone here is listening and wants data on Latitude, please feel free to reach out personally. Hit me up on Twitter, um, Marulo, Joe, and, and I can give you more details on that and, and help you get in. And I guess it, it sounds like it's changing, but how did they make money? Like, were they a traditional accelerator that, you know, took 5 7% of the company in exchange for a bit of money? Or is it like pure nonprofit or or what, how, like how, what kind of category is Latitude in? Latitude had a couple of different components to it, or I should say has. Um, there is a traditional venture fund tied to it, which is doing cash for equity. I'm not sure of the details on, on the terms. You'd have to reach out to them and check. I believe it's somewhere in the 150 to 250 uh, range, uh, kind of like a flat check basis. Um, and then they had the community program. I, I would hesitate to call it an accelerator, just given uh, it was a cash program. Um, no demo day tied to it, more of just you know community building and introductions and kind of how to get started in, in LATAM type thing. Uh, but that was, again, cash. I think it was like uh, it was between $500 to $1,000 per, per cohort. Um, so yeah, most of their monetization was driven through that. Uh, they did just launch a fintech product uh, called Meridian, which is looking like Mercury for uh, Brazil at the moment, it's a beautiful product, well-designed banking service. Um, and they have a couple of other, other things as well, like corporation services. It's uh, generally an interesting company. I'm, I'm not super close with the, the business team there, so I can't give full details on monetization, but um, I can tell you they have attracted investment from top VCs and, and, and very reputable folks in, in their ecosystem. So I'm sure they're, they're doing something important and, and special here. Yeah. And let's talk a bit about the 
Mexican startup ecosystem at large. I know this is something you wanted to touch upon in this episode. In, do you feel like in some ways this is your the first kind of time you've really stepped into you know, a city startup ecosystem or when you were involved with uh, the co-living company, did you, did you really feel like you were kind of in the startup game back then as well? Or do you, or do you kind of feel like a first time startup guy right now? I definitely feel like a first time founder. Um, <laughs> the experience is, is notably different than being an operator. You really get put into the driver's seat and as, as much as you think you could do as an operator when it comes to actually doing it and, and dealing with all of that which results from being a CEO, um, nothing really could prepare you. Uh, so it's, it's vastly, vastly different, but it's a great question. And, um, you know, being an operator and being in, in the startup circles in New York and in SF primarily, you know, I was exposed to a little bit of it. I would say the community in CDMX is very special in the sense it's tremendously uh, relationship focus. There's always events going on. There's always something to do with other founders, other investors, and kind of build those relationships natively. Um, it's beautiful. Um, I think that's what in turn has drawn so many founders to come here and start companies. Um, I, I couldn't name a better place to start a company right now. The access to capital is here. The ideas are here. The talent's here. It's, it's really just a, a fantastic place. <laughs> Sounds like there's a lot of bonding over uh, tequila behind the scenes. There is, man. There is. There's certainly the taco nights. Um, there's certainly the happy hours. You know, I think the hardest thing is choosing which events to go to, to be honest with you. There's just so much. Yeah. And so for people that uh, are having a hard time picture, can you kind of paint the landscape of like a, a week in the life of a startup founder in Mexico City? Where to begin, man? Uh, it's a beautiful life. You're probably living Roma, Polanco, Condesa, you know, given access to, to office space, security, all of that. Uh, streets are beautiful, tree line, birds are chirping, as you all have heard in this, this call. Uh, you have your, your occasional street vendor walking by. Anyway, head over to your office, grab a coffee, do your thing. Um, work days are long here. Um, one of the most impressive things I've seen with the Mexican work culture is their dedication um, and their nature to be very hardworking. Uh, people here are in early 8 30 9 a.m they're out late they're really you know putting in the hours so you're with your team these days in the office grinding and every other week maybe you find an event that you think is worth going to meet some new people meet some new investors friends founders whatever it might be you know go jam with some ideas and then do it again um, weekends are beautiful you can pop out to any of the nice beaches we have here the mountains go hiking there's too much to do. I think that's the uh, the biggest downside to living here, man. It's it's too much fun sometimes. You must be in a nice zone because we're uh, how how long are we into the episode? Half hour, and I haven't heard the Fiero Viejo guys pass yeah, by your window. I know, man. It's crazy. I live um, I live south of Condesa, about twenty thirty minutes, and um, you know I, I do love those areas that I just rambled off, um, but. You know, there is something nice to being in a little bit of more chilled out locations, private, very quiet. And um, you know, I like I like it now. So it's been good. Um, been here for a few months now. And how much of the startup scene do you think is um, kind of uh, 100%? It's, I don't know how to phrase this question, but the the uh, the digital nomads and the uh, basically Americans that have come to Mexico must have really changed the landscape of the, the Mexican startup scene in terms of, uh, you know, bringing in some, some new people with new ideas and, and talented developers. And uh, I guess there's probably a mix of like 100% Mexican companies and then other companies like yourself or like Pacto with Ryan Croft, where it's like part, it's like an American Mexican company. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah, if you, if you look at the region 10 years ago to where it's at today, I mean, it's it's two entirely different ecosystems. Um, I mean, there's always been the Brian Records of the world, the you know, unbridled founders who are going to go at it 100% and take the risks and going into new regions before they're hot and try to build something transformative. And those guys were here before. You know, they're impressive. There's not many of them, but 
uh, they did contribute to the ecosystem in those early days. Uh, and then there's folks like myself, you know, we're younger, I'm in my late twenties. We didn't have the opportunity to come in 10 years ago. We were still, a, still in school. Um, but now we're making the contributions to the region and taking the, the lifestyle that we've seen and, and the products we've seen in more developed economies and trying to give that type of beauty, uh, to an underdeveloped region, uh, by increasing access to whatever it might be with, with Pacto, of course, fair ordering and, and, and more efficient systems for restaurant owners with Arenda, access to liquidity and capital for businesses who may need it. There's various different types of plays um, that more efficient ecosystems have that don't exist here and, of course, are now being created. So it's a cool time to be here. Um, really excited to see where things go over the next 10 years. Feels like we're just getting things kind of started and you know headed in, in this direction now. But as people continue to come down and build, it'll be great to see where things go. And by the way, you, you know, Ryan Croft from like, have you met him in real life? I guess you guys had dinner and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know him pretty well. Um, Ryan's the man. He's a very inspirational entrepreneur to, to have in your circle. He's accomplished amazing things over a couple of projects now. And having been to too many Mexican restaurants, I can certainly say there's, there's a large a large opportunity for innovation in the the POS space and, and making their lives easier. So really excited to follow Pacto's story. Um, only wishing them the best. Sweet. I should have asked at like the very beginning of the episode because uh, I love to have that continuity because kind of every single guest knows at least one other guest on the podcast with very yeah. few exceptions. So I'm glad I'm glad we have the uh, intellectual continuity here. Nice. No, they're awesome. I met Gordon and Ryan recently for dinner, and uh, you know they're just as impressive in real life as they are on any podcast you may hear. <laughs> so, uh, you know, certainly awesome guys to have. Oh man, what you must have some stories though about um, having some funny meetings or uh, cultural uh, misunderstandings and stuff like that. From a, from a business perspective, right? You're going around, you're drumming up business, financing, deals, blah, blah, blah. You got any good stories? Dude, where to begin on this? Um, I mean, the first, the first couple of days, months, you're here. If you don't speak Spanish, they can certainly be a little tough. Um, you know, the amount of misunderstandings in taxis in particular, uh, certainly endless. Um, but as we get to like a more serious level in business, let me think. Um, no, I mean, if you're like, you know, doing, if you're doing business with investors here, of course, like cultural differences need to be considered and I know all of that can make it, you know, an interesting, an interesting time. Um, I, I've been lucky to really have had the opportunity to, to chat and work with people who are just truly fantastic and understanding of <laughs> the gringo mindset. So it's been good. Uh, but, you know, you certainly do notice those cultural differences. Um, you know, in the U.S., we're very direct um, we're on time, <laughs> most importantly, uh, down here, everyone's a little more, um, I don't know, a little bit warmer. Um, they don't like to say no as much. They try to be, um, a little bit more indirect in that sense and always running five, 10 minutes late. But, you know, aside from that, it's been a pleasure and, you know, really, really nice place to do business. Dude, it's, it's wild. Um, people hate saying no here. I, I, I don't know where it stems from, uh, but it's one of those like funny stereotypes, which is kind of true. Uh, people are very indirect in, in communications, which they might be trying to get away from. And um, as a result, you know, sometimes you have to deal with uh, kind of obscure messaging and, and phone calls with people. Um, you know, on the client side, Typically in financing, people don't really have that opportunity. Um, so, you know, with dealing with customers, we're, we're pretty straightforward, but you certainly do see it, especially, um, you know, at the higher levels, people just kind of drop off rather than saying, hey, like, this is our position. We're not doing X, Y, and Z for X, Y, and Z reasons. They just kind of disappear. So. You just get ghosted in, instead of a definitive answer. Yeah. But I mean, look, like, it's a good lesson. Um, you know, it's led me to understand that if you don't have a clear yes, you have a clear no. Um, and that's, you know, ever more true down here than anywhere else that I've seen. 
You know, if people are not, you know, hitting you up, asking you to do X, Y, and Z, whatever it might be, like, just forget that that opportunity exists. It's probably gone. Yeah, that's definitely a good lesson. And um, yeah, I can 100% agree with that. Yeah, it seems pervasive. I've, I've heard it's, uh, it's very common through the region, not just Mexico. I'm sure you've seen it other places, no? It definitely is. And I think that the worst iteration of this is when they kind of give an excuse or two why. And then you're like, okay, well, I'll just solve those things, blah, blah, blah. And maybe you invest even more time. Maybe you come back to them. And then they have some other like random bad excuse just because there was no no early on. For sure. Absolutely. I think like one of those things that people see here is that there are – problematic businesses going on maybe it's fraud maybe it's uh a potential scam like people like naturally have very high defenses because of that um you know people still today are afraid of banking like i think it's like 40 percent of the country doesn't have a a credit card or maybe even a a debit card some crazy statistics floating around there so like you see like natural defensiveness definitely on many fronts and when you're doing business, overcoming that and being genuine and conveying that you're the real deal, you're not here to play games, you're not here to steal something, you're not here to misrepresent, like you're doing X, Y, and Z and you're pitching that, it's extremely important. And if you can't nail that, like people certainly are going to get skeptical quickly. I have a question for you, Joe. So why are you trying to move beyond rent payments so fast? Don't you think that you should focus on the rent payment thing because that's so novel and kind of take that as far as it can can go. Because, I mean, that's got to be like a multi-billion dollar opportunity in and of itself. Like, why would you try to manage, you know, the rent payment thing and like SaaS receivables and other types of receivables? Opportunity and time. I'd rather be first mover in a market and fail because I try to do too much then stay with one vertical and and miss my chance. Um, This is still an opportunity which we have not seen a developed ecosystem emerge from a competition standpoint. There's very few names that come to mind when we look at tech enabled B2B financing and especially when we look at the exact type of product we have, I I can name two people that are doing it. So from our side, the thought is if we have the resources available if we have the drive, the motivation available, and we have the talent available, we're going to take that shot 10 out of 10 times. But you're also kind of saying like, we know how to price everything. Or we know how to price like multiple very distinct industries. You know what I mean? Where every, every new kind of silo that, you're, that you say like, I know how to find like the financial price of this. It's like a lot. It's... Um, and, in some ways, it's diversifying, but in some ways, it's adding risk. I don't, it's a bit of both. I, I think the question to ask is if we know how to underwrite. Yeah, the underwrite. Pricing, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. The pricing's like, you can you can work backwards from what banks are charging, what other fintechs are doing. Like It's, um, it's an important question for sure, but it's something which is straightforward-ish. The million-dollar question is, if you're building a lending business or you're building uh, access to lending, in the case that we are, yeah, because you're the underwriter. We're the under exactly. This is this is the question that needs to be answered when you if you're an investor looking at lending or access to lending products is is can that originator underwrite appropriately to not blow up their book, and can they do it in such a way that they can scale the product quick enough to not die in the process? Because uh, it's expensive. End of the day, you're spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars mm-hmm. each, each week building out a tech product for this market and then you're throwing debt into it it's, it's a complicated structure no? and so are you keeping the loans on your books or are you trying to work with i imagine you're trying to work with partners but it's early days to like totally. sell, sell these loans on yeah so we, we do sell them on today um we keep small exposure kind of like a junior a junior uh exposure on all of them as a first loss piece uh, to have some skin in the game there uh, the majority of that risk is held by a third party, uh, which is critical uh, in the early days uh, to have. You know, if you're holding balance sheet risk, uh, 
not only is it extremely expensive to raise that equity, it's difficult. And in a market like today, raising millions of dollars in equity to have being distributed as lending capital is um, highly inefficient and probably impossible to do if you're not yeah, someone. Yeah. So it's capital. always been a part of the business model to sell on the loans that you originate. Yeah, we started out like super early, the first couple of loans on balance sheet to try to you know put together a book which we could show to investors saying, hey, like this is our underwriting criteria. This is our loan tape. This is how we do business. This is a real business. You have to do that. But after like a couple to scale that, you need off balance sheet capital um, and you need to start thinking about how you're going to scale for us. We're thinking of building an exchange, uh, providing access to those receivables for various different investors who want access. Uh, but there's numerous ways you can take it. You could continue to raise debt capital and do it yourself. Um, you could, in theory, finance these on your balance sheet if you were someone who had that type of capital. Um, so there's a, a number of ways to, to skin it. Um, but again, yeah, the question is, is okay. how do you distribute, how do you underwrite, and how do you fund? And um, and so what, what else are we underwriting? So we're underwriting these, uh, uh, the loan, sorry, the rent stuff. Um, I guess you mentioned SaaS. I think you mentioned one or two, but I kind of skipped over it. Could you, what, what else is in the, the, um, the future? For sure. So today it's, it's important to note we are just underwriting rent risks. Um, we've grown our book in a very quick velocity with just this receivable class. Um, as we look towards the future, we're now starting to experiment with SaaS revenue, subscription revenues, and royalties. Um, these are three new verticals which uh, we're looking to bring onto the platform in the near future. Of course, we're still a young company. Um, you know, we're looking to do so in a way which we can execute on. Um, we just kicked off our wait list for the SaaS product, um, and of course, are you know in the process of bringing that in. But mm. the wait once- list that we were talking about—that that's purely SaaS. Uh, SaaS subscription services companies that, that have recurring revenue, correct? Royalties, okay. we didn't know okay. that. We're, okay. we're still you know, in the early stages of the building. And what, is, what does royalties look like? Royalties would be recurring revenue from media contracts, music contracts, things of that nature. Um, we've seen this done in the U.S., um, not typically uh, very popular in Latin America, but we're interested in exploring the space and you know, would encourage anybody working with these types of assets to get in touch. Certainly interested to hear more. So sounds like the idea is um, if people have a, uh, a bit of a wacky financial asset they just, in Latin America, they just need to go to the gringo and the gringo is going <laughs> to underwrite it. If someone has recurring revenue, we'll underwrite it for you. That's the- <laughs> If you have recurring payments and need liquidity and don't want to mortgage a property or don't want to take out some sort of very predatory personal product, we'll help uh-huh. you securitize your recurring revenue and transform that into upfront cash. Have you ever thought about going to like Mexican celebrities and doing it as like a sweetheart deal just for some press and being like, Luis Miguel just like fronted a year's royalties for 20 million. I don't know, <laughs> something like that. It could be cool, man. And I, I think that it needs to be investigated. Um, you know, my, my primary focus today is on real estate and SaaS. But when we look at royalties, when we look at subscription revenues, there's a number of non-traditional businesses and, and revenue stream owners, which very well may need that liquidity for whatever reason. And being able to provide that to them through, through our platform is something we're very interested in. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Do you, do you feel like you should try to get like some MIT mathematicians on the case and just like let them loose and they're, they're going to find some very interesting ways to underwrite uh, different, different, you know, assets in Latin America? Yeah. You know, I actually just did that with a group of MBAs from uh, Notre Dame. Uh, we had them in for about a week uh, back in March and they came up with some very interesting uh, data points for us to look at and actually built into our underwriting model. So uh, totally, we're always looking for the top talent, especially in data, in order to help us understand how we can underwrite smarter and and provide a more seamless experience for our users. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Quick break from the podcast to tell you about Language Blend, the best new way to learn Spanish. Language Blend was co-founded by Jake Nomada, friend of the podcast, 
decade of experience in Latin America. And Jake and his team, they put everything into this program that they wish they had in terms of how to level up quickly with your Spanish language skills. Because the faster that you can get conversationally fluent in Spanish, the better the experience that you're going to have in Latin America. So go to languageblend.com for more information. Mm -hmm. Because I think you probably will have to keep some, like you, you can't be like a pure software business. You have to have some sort of identity as, as like a financial company too, and, and sort of track to things in a traditional financial way, I think a little bit, or sort of just sort of like keep tabs of where the traditional financing is too, because, and especially when I, maybe you do this or don't do this, but you, you, maybe you're getting involved in deals where that, uh, obviously that landowner or, or that SaaS company, they probably have people who are senior uh, in terms of the, the debt uh, hierarchy to you, right? So you're taking like a more junior position to these guys? Yeah, it's important to, to understand the financial picture of everyone in, in the underwriting process. You know, like you just said, we're, we're a bit of a hybrid right now. You know, the overall vision, of course, is go to the software side and really sit between the two parties in this marketplace format as an exchange. But you know, today we are coordinating the financing ourselves with with a, a dedicated partner. Um, but you know, when we look at that underwriting model, understanding where we sit in the capital stack for each of our users is critical to making a credit new decision. Um, we're able to identify this through um, through technology. Uh, we're able to look at digital repositories and understand who has liens on property and if we're senior or junior to 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 the asset pretty easily. Um, so building that into our model at scale is is what we're doing um, and what we've done to date to in order financing to be deployed. Mm -hmm. And you, you know what else uh, I definitely wanted to ask you is just that um, even accessing traditional capital is hard in Latin America. Like accessing, I, we kind of touched on this, but accessing a traditional mortgage is hard for a SaaS company to uh, access capital through their existing accounts receivable, right? They're there are 60 and 90 days account receivable. That's even that's hard to get money on in Latin America. And, and then, uh, did, did you ever consider, um, working with those more traditional asset classes and just saying, look, we can do this better than, uh, than the, you know, the very slow incumbent banks in Mexico. For sure. And we've seen a wave of amazing players, um, uh, born recently specifically on the mortgage side originating mortgages for more traditional players which have the deposits which have the top access to capital um, and they've crushed it uh, we've seen yave uh, ola casa morgana um, i believe credit credito uh, out of monterey credit maybe k-r-e-d-i-t um, all backed by yc or, or accelerators of the like and, and absolutely going bonkers in terms of growth. So we're seeing, we're seeing it for sure. Okay. So there are uh, startups do, uh, doing this. Typically speaking, if you have a traditional financial product you'd like to originate, there is a bank who will buy that from you. However, if you don't have a traditional financial product like what we've created, you're going to have to structure the back end of that yourself, um, which in turn is what we spent a lot of our time doing. Um, at scale, the conversations become different. Then you can go towards that exchange layer and really sit as just the originator and servicer. Um, but until you're able to build out that asset class, um, you're you're a hybrid. You know, you're doing it. You're doing both yourself. Um, so yeah, we're we're here today in, in Latin America doing this. In the U.S., there's Pipe, there's Cap Chase, there's Steady Technologies now doing rents. Um, so as we look towards the future, seeing this as a more defined asset class is interesting. And of course, considering banks' appetite for it, uh, something to, to consider as well. We're building, expecting that they will want these receivables and allowing them to tap into the platform to access this type of return is uh, how we view the future. Okay. Yeah, that's encouraging to hear that there, there are startups that are taking care of different aspects of uh, financing. And I'm, I'm glad you guys found a niche. I mean, from my perspective, I feel like a not enough is uh, is moving because 
a traditional mortgage in Latin America is still like a 15% and, and all this stuff. It, <laughs> it's crazy, right? Dude, I just got a quote for a mortgage from one of these wonderful tax disruptors. And it was at, I think, 15%, maybe 14 and a half. It, it's just painful. It's, it's insane. And um, as a result, I mean, here in Mexico, I think 16% of the population who owns a home has a mortgage was the last stat I saw. It's, it's insanely low. People here are, are very used to paying cash and avoiding those, those interests as they become very difficult to deal with over time. Yeah, I always had this idea for a business where we would help foreigners buy property in Latin America and provide them a mortgage because they can't get like a local mortgage, but maybe we can kind of figure something out. I don't know if you're kind of lending against maybe other U.S. assets these uh, foreigners have or you, you found a way to kind of finance that or, or, or you know, be able to get a lien on that property locally in Mexico or whatever. But I think um, pretty much every digital nomad and expat that I talk to, they'd love to eventually get a, a property, you know, and, and stop Airbnb and uh, I don't know. How, how would you approach a problem like that? I would invest in a company called No Lab, which is doing exactly what you just described. Um, they're a prop tech company, which is disrupting cross-border real estate transactions. Uh, founded by um, a lovely Mexican family, actually, it's two brothers and a sister behind it. And they're focused on enabling cross-border purchases and financing between the U.S., Mexico, Spain, and Portugal. Uh, brilliant team based here in Polanco, and um, they've bootstrapped to date and have just insane traction. Uh, really, really impressive company doing seven figures plus revenue um, annualized. It's uh, it's a really cool project to follow. Interesting. How do you spell that? N O L A B. No lab. Okay, I will take. Do you know these guys? Try to get them on the podcast. For sure, man. Happy to make an intro. Okay, sweet, sweet. Um, I know we wanted to talk a bit about angel investing. So you've been doing some angel investing yourself as well. I have. Yeah, primarily focused on fintech and prop tech in in Latin America. Um, starting to look couple of other different verticals. Generally, um, I'll invest in what I understand <laughs> and, and what I think I can bring extended value to outside of just capital. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a fantastic ecosystem, a lot of really good early stage opportunities. And you've been deploying capital in both Mexico and in Colombia? Yes, it's correct. That's crazy, man. You're moving fast. I'm trying, man. We only have so much time. Um, by no means. <laughs> By no means am I deploying large quantities of capital right now. I'm going off my personal balance sheet. Um, but you know, having the experience I have over the years from June and even in the CRE space before that, now at, at Arenda, um, I find working with startups to help them go through their problems and find product market fit, it's, it's enjoyable. And having some skin in the game as I work alongside those, those founders is, is nice. So. So how many up. angel investments have you made? I have five to date, um, all focused in Mexico and Colombia. Um, majority are fintech. Um, I do have one prop tech investment at the moment. Um, of course, always looking to grow that. So, you know, if there's any fintech or prop tech founders out there listening, feel free to reach out. would love to learn more about what you're building and see if I can help. And what's kind of your personal strategy behind doing this, Joe? Do you, are you just trying to kind of keep it? Uh, like build relationships and stuff like that? Because I, you know, you're, it probably represents a pretty meaningful amount of, of your kind of capital, right? Are you just trying to, you know, get a board observer seat and, and kind of stay involved in the ecosystem? Is it no, I don't think any board seats in the investments. Um, I don't think it brings any value to the founders having myself uh, there. I, I trust that if there's an issue that they feel like they can come to me with and I can have a meaningful contribution to, they will. Um, so, you know, really my, my emphasis there is to help create the world that I want to see. And using my, my capital as votes really towards that and, and backing the, the founders and backing the companies, which I believe have the trajectory to create that world. Um, one of the biggest questions I ask myself when I make an investment is one, would I want to use this product myself? And two, 
does this technology, does this product make the world a better place? And if a company can convince me strongly on those two reasons, you know, we're pretty much there. Um, that being said, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, I try to be very selective and um, really make sure that I'm empowering companies which are bringing that positive change. Yeah, it, it, that's really cool, man. Uh, talking about being an American and angel investing in Latin America. Did you did you have any mentors in this or how did you kind of make your first investment? Did you fall into this or was this something that you you really thought like, I want to be an angel investor in Latin America? Totally fell into it. Um, I wish I had a mentor. <laughs> Certainly taking uh, taking offers if there's anyone out there who's, who's crushed it as an angel and has created that change they want to see. Um, you know, generally speaking, you know, you, if you are able to make those bets um, and you have that experience as a founder, I think generally you're able to have a pretty calculated approach as to what is going to work and what won't. And of course, highly volatile investing in this asset class. You never know what's going to fit until 10 years, five, 10 years down the road. But, um, you know, I feel like the experience I've had from working in private real estate, um, into startups, going through the journey from pre-seed to series B, founding my own company, I feel like I can get a pretty good sense for what's worth investing my capital and time into. And um, as a result, I've, I've made a couple of picks so far. That being said, I am uh, I'm a very early stage person myself. Uh, I'm sure I'll make some mistakes. I'm sure I'll make some bad picks, but I'm having a fun time in the process and you know, trying to help those people enjoy their time too. So um, I'm sure whatever happens, it'll, it'll have a good outcome. And I think one thing that's cool about the idea of angel investing in Latin America is you can actually have a lot more at bats because the amount of capital required is probably a little bit lower than the United States, right? And so if you kind of assume just a similar uh, percentage chance of success and percent like just like percentage ROI of the outcome, at very least you can get more at bats because these days, I remember like 10 years ago, you could put five, 10 K, 10 K let's say, into a company and that was a legit angel investment, but the numbers are just so much bigger now. I bet you probably need to put minimum 50 or like even a hundred just to be just, to, you know, on a per investment basis in the States, just to get on the cap table. Whereas in Latin America, probably five, 10 K will still get you on the cap table. For sure. Yeah. You'd be surprised at the very small amount of capital you need to get access to deals. That being said, uh, top deals are always going to require you know, reasonable, meaningful stakes in order to get into. You have to balance out dilution. You have to balance out opportunity. But that being said, there's so many chances you can get to get in on deals down here, um, especially if you're tapped into the early ecosystem, if you're plugged in with the founder circles, if you're plugged in with the local community, the local accelerators, you're going to be seeing pre-seed deals from top founders all the time. There's no shortage. Um, so having yeah, having small stakes in a lot of these companies, I think is uh, it's a good diversified way to approach approach the game. That being said, if I, if I was in it to get rich, I'm, I would not be doing this. I'd be playing, you know, the, the private equity game. I'd be playing maybe public markets uh, derivatives or something. Yeah, it's fun to you. Yeah, this is fun, man. I I, I love it. Um, I love yeah. seeing these ideas come to life and, and building these businesses from zero. It's yeah, yeah. And I think we, at least with Latin America, you can kind of get your thrills and, and be in the game without breaking the bank as an angel, right? Like, <laughs> like if you want to be an angel in the States, it's going to cost you and you want to be somewhat diversified, like do at least 10 investments that that's going to cost you like half a million bucks probably, mm -hmm. but you could probably get in 10 companies in Latin America for, I don't know, hundred K a little less. And for sure, it'll be, it'll be just as fun. Yeah, exactly. And, and then again, you're also seeing those companies build what you hope to see one day in an ecosystem where you live and where you will eventually use those products or maybe know somebody who will use those products. It's amazing. 
Um, so really happy to support such a developing ecosystem. I'm starting to look outside, starting to you know, research a little bit about Africa, starting to see a little bit of deal flow from Southeast Asia, but you know, generally speaking, uh, focus on Latin America and uh, will likely remain so as time goes on. Yeah. Where do you get deal flow in Latin America? Like, What, what are the secret sources of deal flow? Man, being a founder, number one, um, <laughs> I would say you know, the amount of deals that just kind of arrive to you from friends and people looking for advice is it's tough to quantify. You know, on a weekly basis, there's someone reaching out saying, hey, Joe, like my friend's exploring this idea in fintech. I know you did X, Y, and Z. Are you open to chat? Yeah, of course. Or you know, the same for prop tech. There's accelerators as well. You can kind of you know, get into and, and look at them from an LP standpoint and see their deals. Um, so yeah, personal network really number one, um, having built a reputation as you know, a reputable founder and someone who's happy to help, I think is the best thing you can do if you're looking to do this. If you're um, or maybe on the operator side, you know, really emphasizing on helping others and checking in with the founders and saying, hey, what can I do to see you succeed? It goes a long way. Yeah. Do you think uh, Latin America or U.S. has a more concentrated entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? Because in the U.S., you could argue it's pretty concentrated or was at least in Silicon Valley and in Boston. Um, but at this point, I guess there's kind of accelerators everywhere in the U.S. In, in Latin America, do you think comparatively it's maybe more concentrated? Yeah, that's a great question. I think on the coastal portions of the United States, we're still seeing the highest concentration. Silicon Valley will always be Silicon Valley. Yeah, uh, for sure. It's spread out a bit, though, I would say, right? Like Totally. No, yeah. totally. Uh, COVID in, in particular really democratized access to VC and all of that. But there's something special about that area where you're going to see the top entrepreneurs flock towards year after year. YC is always going to be YC. And while people are still trying to create that in, in Latin America, I I don't think it's quite there yet. Um, we do have wonderful hubs with some centralization. Mexico City, Bogota, Sao Paulo, probably the top three that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're still in the early days, man. This is like, uh, I don't know what it's compared to. This is like maybe the 90s of Silicon Valley, like super early, 80s, something, something years ago. So as, as things evolve, as, as capital continues to find its way to smart companies in, in the region, we certainly will see consolidation. And um, you know, I think there's a, a very bright future behind the region, but a, a way to go, certainly. Mm -hmm. what, about, what about yourself? What have, you, what have you seen over the years? Well, I think it's interesting to compare um, the startup ecosystems in Latin America and kind of overlay that compared to the digital nomad hubs, which have overlap, but they're also a little bit different. Uh, sounds like the startup ecosystems are a little bit more tied to the financial centers of the country, right? Because the digital nomads are in Medellin. Uh, the digital nomads might be in Guadalajara as well, uh, which, you know, they're, they're tech hubs. But so it's kind of like in, in these two countries, maybe there's a different uh, balance between, you know, Bogota, Guadalajara, Monterey versus, uh, and, and Medellin and Bogota. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah, I've heard good things about Medellin. Uh, trying to head down in May to check it out. Um, you know, it seems to be still developing, but certainly an ecosystem to keep our eyes on. How, how would you rank the top three in terms of startup ecosystem? Would, would you... Uh, would you put it as as uh, Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, or? Yeah, I I am not super in tune with the Brazilian ecosystem, so I think my opinion is is not uh, something that to hold a lot of weight. Um, I've heard amazing things. Um, we've seen amazing things, especially in the fintech industry, emerge from Brazil. Um, but I, I I feel that Mexico City is likely ahead of there, uh, just given that the distribution of companies that are working here tends to be focused on more, more surface area, given we have the region to other Spanish-speaking countries. People in Mexico City are building for here, but also for 
Paraguay, for Argentina, for Chile, for Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, wherever it might be. So I, I think there's a bit of higher reach here. Um, that being said, I'd, I'd likely put Brazil number two. Um, it's certainly not an easy country to disrupt. Uh, from what I've heard, it's very, <laughs> it's very insular in um, kind of distribution. It's difficult to break into as an outsider is kind of what I'm trying to get at. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Colombia would put his third. Um, that being said, I'm sure there's a lot of people who would probably disagree with me, especially as we get into Colombia's third. There's, I mean, it makes of- sense if, if only because of the population size. It is small. Yeah, it's very small. But when we look at the rest of Latin America, I mean, maybe Argentina is, is going to be larger. Maybe, maybe Venezuela from a, a population basis. But I don't think there's more than five or ten companies that are VC-backed in, in mm-hmm. Venezuela. Um, I, I was trying to weave in uh, talking about Guadalajara in there in my previous question, but I didn't. I wasn't too successful, but how do you, but a lot of people refer to Guadalajara as the Silicon Valley of Mexico. T- tell me a little bit about Guadalajara. Have you taken some visits there and checked out the community? How's kind of the relationship between the two, two communities, uh, GDL and Mexico City? Yeah, good timing on that question, man. So my team was actually there this weekend, uh, speaking at an event um, for real estate brokers and developers. Um, I wasn't able to make it there, unfortunately, but I heard amazing things. Um, I've heard it referenced as the Silicon Valley of of Mexico, of Latin America. Um, that being said, I still do not understand why. Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of tend to agree with you. Keep going. <laughs> I've, never, like, I've never hired anyone out of there. I've never even like seen a resume that I've interviewed out of Guadalajara. And... Um, I, I, just, I, I don't know why it has that reputation, to be totally honest with you. Um, if anything, I would say, you know, the Condesa Roma, Polanco area of Mexico City would be would be that. Uh, maybe Santa Fe. You know, it's um, the, the city here is just it's it, it's so fascinating. The amount of talent that's accumulated from all over the world. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, man, I, in short, I, I kind of agree with you. I'm a little confused as to why. Guadalajara is uh, called that. Maybe Globant, I think their headquarters are over there. could be the reason why. But Who's that? Uh, Globant, um, one of the Latin American unicorns. Uh, they focused on software as a service, uh, like creation, IT, and software development. I'm trying to really – this is, this is going to be the year 2023 where my Latin life gets much more involved in the, the startup ecosystem in Latin America. Nice. I think – I think as digital nomads, we, as I mentioned, we kind of tend to avoid dealing with the local economy and the local business. But, you know, as, as this conversation attests to, there's really a lot of dynamic activity in Latin America, and it seems to be getting much more sophisticated and comparable to the U.S. every day. It's certainly an interesting ecosystem to be in. Um, and I, I, I can't urge people enough that if you're thinking about making a positive impact in the world and want, want to experience something new to consider Latin America, um, the people are very welcoming. If you're here for good, if you're here to, for a positive change, you will be supported. You will find your way, you know, find the backing. It's, um, you know, it's something which has been, it's a region I think which is very reciprocative to, to this type of mindset. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> until you start foreclosing on buildings and, and taking them, and then they're going to be like this damn gringo. Totally. No, you, you, you gotta, you gotta work with the people here. You can't, you can't play any funny games or, you know, you're not going to go far. Do you, do you get the building? If, uh, I guess so. Right. If they stop um, paying up. Yeah. We have, um, we have a pretty diversified attachment strategy over our financings, which provides security. Uh-huh. Um, that does include real estate. <laughs> I like it. Providing access to capital to businesses in Mexico. It's, uh, it's genius, but it's also crazy. Especially, it's risky. It uh, is risky. What, what are you hearing at this point in, in the cycle? Like, are people still pretty down? Or are they saying, 
you know, this, this would have been great a couple of years ago, but now we're taking a more conservative approach. Yeah. You really have two sides of the coin. You have the opinions from traditional market makers, financiers, uh, maybe even VCs, arguably, who may not be educated in, in private credit and, and debt, who are very conservative, who are winding back their bets, who are winding back their loan making and really saying, we're very you know, concerned with where this may go. We're not going to participate. We're going to stay on the sidelines for another three to six months. Um, and on the other side, you have private financiers who are sophisticated in, in debt placements, who are sophisticated in maybe strategic equity, and they're saying, wow, okay, we have banks winding back. We have traditional financiers terrified to move. This is the golden age. This is when we're going to make our fortunes. Uh, and you see very robust investment activity occurring on the private credit side. You're seeing facilities being raised from a lot of top fintechs right now, um, fully uh, you know, in senior, senior uh, structures, um, which maybe wouldn't have been getting done, uh, at least at the velocity they were in the past years. Um, the opportunity for smart origination in the private credit market is robust right now. We're very happy with the opportunities we're seeing and are expecting uh, you know, the next 12 to 24 months to continue staying this way. Um, mm -hmm. So where, where others falter, we thrive. We're very excited to see where this goes. Um, private credit as a whole right now is becoming a very interesting asset for institutional and private LPs alike. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely interesting at a, at a micro and macro level. Um, th this question is very out of order with the episode, but I want to make sure to ask. So are you lending primarily against residential uh, leases or commercial leases? And is it how does it geographically get split up in Mexico? Like, do you think it's maybe um, heavily weighted towards, I don't know, like <laughs> properties in Quintana Roo or is it more in the center of the country? You know what I mean? Like, uh, do you, could, like how does the portfolio uh, break down? We do work with both property types today, commercial and residential. The majority are commercial real estate, primarily bodegas like um, warehouses, office buildings, and then um, like agricultural food processing lands. It's a very popular uh, industry here in Mexico. Okay. Uh, and the majority of these, pro these properties are not in Mexico City. They're, they're spread throughout the country. From so the majority Leon. commercial. Yeah, almost, you know, entirely, almost entirely commercial. Almost I have entirely commercial, but not necessarily office buildings. It's like other type of stuff, like all industrial sorts. stuff. Yeah, look, look, uh, like uh, shopping centers, offices, food processing, warehouse, industrial, uh, antennas, various different things. And a lot of that business is coming from secondary and tertiary markets, uh, places like Nuevo Leon, uh, Oaxaca. Uh, Chiapas, uh, Querétaro, Puebla, started in Mexico, um, Jalisco even. And we, we've seen a, a, a vast variety of geographies present in our portfolio today. Mm -hmm. And have like when you look at these contracts, like you read these lease agreements, I bet they're a little bit wacky sometimes and they're very different than what a, a lease agreement is must look like in the United States, or I, perhaps there's like more um, like differentiation from agreement to agreement, whereas maybe in the U S it's more cookie cutter and more standardized. Whereas here, yeah. maybe it's a little bit, I don't know, shooting by the hip and uh, from an agreement perspective, is, would that be accurate? Yeah. Especially in residential commercial is a bit more standardized given the ticket size, the parties that are being involved, the use of factors like invoices and all of that. So uh -huh. it's, um, it's a little bit more plain vanilla, but when we look at residential in particular, I mean, we've seen, we've seen a little bit of everything, uh, from contracts that look like they were drawn up on a napkin to 30, 40 page, <laughs> contracts, which just ramble on, on nonsense. <laughs> It's, it's crazy, man. There's, there's no secret. And uh, there's some great prop tech players. Shout out to Naver. Shout out to Murata Uno, Homie, Home, uh, that are working on this, this sector, trying to disrupt and create a little bit of a higher level of standardization and repu uh, reputation for these, these transactions to take place. But right now, it's the Wild West in real estate. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy. 
Hey guys, quick interruption to tell you about BitRefill. BitRefill is the best way to convert your crypto into gift card balances. These are gift cards that you can spend at Hotels.com, Airbnb, Nike, and many more. You may remember Joel Valenzuela, previous podcast guest. He's been living on crypto exclusively since 2015, and he's a big consumer of BitRefill. And so I asked Joel, I said, what do you like most about BitRefill? He said that he likes the instant delivery, the precise amount so that you don't have to juggle a lot of gift cards, and he loves the global selection. Nobody else has this much selection of gift cards, over 10,000 gift card options across hundreds of countries. Go to bitrefill.com to sign up, and you can also use the code MyLatinLife for 10% back off your first purchase. Go to bitrefill.com for more information. You guys need a new product, like a standardized rental agreement or something. So we, we have it. We, we actually give it out for free. Um, you can go to our website, Arendipudo and Mackey's, and, and access oh. a, free, a, free, uh, a free rental contract. It's just one of those things like, what are you going to do? You're going to make like 500 pesos per contract. And, you know, yeah. Just, yeah. We, we, we said, you that's, know, that, that's good. You're, you're bringing some standardization to the market too. And totally. so uh, it, it makes me think like, how many deals are you passing on? Like what percentage of deals are you passing on? It's wild, man. So when we look at like who's actually completed applications and who's been able to submit all the documentations, the approval rate's very high. It's north of 75%. Oh, wow. But when we Whoa, look at- I was thinking you were going to approve like 10%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but here's, here's the kicker. When you look at everybody who's applied and who actually has the documents that are necessary and who has uh, you know, a lease contract which is legible and enforceable, like, I mean, we're passing on hundreds of people. Um, it is it is very, very low, um, which in turn really fueled our idea to pivot towards the business sector and the commercial real estate sector because of the fact that personas physicas, like individuals, this residential sector is so informal, it's impossible to go in and tie a, a strong financial service into unless you own the entire process, you own the rental, you own the transaction beforehand and can standardize it yourself. Otherwise, you're stuck trying to work with very little. And, um, you know, it's, it's crazy how informal this market is, but that's the reality. It's just something which, when you look outside of Mexico City, when you look outside of Monterrey, Guadalajara, uh, one of these places, it's just, it's old school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is what I was asking in the beginning, so I finally got it out <laughs> a little bit more. Um, <laughs> Okay. No, no, it makes sense. Ah, damn. I had a, a quick question and I know we're kind of already uh, pretty deep into the episode, but I, I, I'm very curious about this. Um, and I think, I think anyone is really, that's looking at doing business in Mexico, but so all of these contracts are a little bit different and a little bit weird. And I, I think you said uh, an enforceable contract. And so do you have to have a, a lawyer and a, uh, look through every single application and that must mean that you're you kind of have to invest a fair amount of time and money into each application that you receive uh in order to you know pay for that lawyer resource to even review the deal yeah it's an awesome question and um the reality is is that we use ai for the majority of our underwriting process to create an automated uh decision um part of that is contract review but there is a layer in which an AI, an OCR program cannot evaluate validity and substance of a contract. And uh, we do have a lawyer in-house who is responsible for this final review of documentation. Um, it doesn't take very long. It's for a trained eye, you can determine if something is uh, enforceable and, and real from the lease standpoint pretty quickly, combined with verification of escritoras like property deeds, uh, checks on the, the version of the UCC here. It's called the, the rug. You can make a decision pretty that, quick. That's a big thing. Like making sure that the person signing the contract is the right person to sign it and that they really are on the deed and that there's no weird back taxes. Like there's so many things, there's so many steps and checks and notaries that need to take place. For sure. And we use technology to overcome 99% of it. Um, we've built a pretty strong platform that enables users to go in, complete a digitized KYC, KYB process, 
go ahead, yeah. submit the documentation. Okay, so the client is kind of submitting a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Well, what if their contract just has like weird clauses in it? Um, like, like what? Yeah, I don't even know, man, but it, it's just, it's hard for me to give an example, but there's, there's certainly weird ones. The weirdest, which would stop us from working with a person would be a, um, no assignment rights clause. So like saying you can't, you can't finance this or you can't assign the benefit of this lease contract to anyone other than the owner. And uh -huh. we haven't seen it yet. Um, uh, but that's like one of those things that is constantly on the top of our list to make sure that it doesn't exist. But I mean, like the things that catch you up, man, they're usually like small little legal errors. Like I just had to turn one down the other day. It was for a five year massive rental contract on a commercial building. Um, but while it referenced five years, like math mathematically, like from April 1st, 2020 to April 1st, 2025, for example, it said contradicting that the contract was for one year. So it's like this contract's from one year from April 1st, 2020 to 2025, right? Contradicts itself. Things like this are they're very common and they'll, they'll make you turn down deals. So unless you can, you know, have those proper contracts in place or have them corrected um, and legally valid, you know, you just, you can't forward. And a lot of those, those companies, which are giving financing to people, you know, they, they have to deal with this type of stuff. And so do, do people have to pay like a, an application fee? I assume not. Probably there's like an origination fee if, if the loan goes through. And so, um, just want to double down on that question. So like you do have to invest a lot because you're investing the AI time to read the contract, but then I imagine everything must be manually reviewed by probably a lawyer and then probably like a, a loan officer. Right. So you, you, you I guess you, um, how do you, how do you do that? Cause, cause that is a, a fair amount of resources. Yeah. Um, we bake all of our costs into one fee. Um, our, our thesis and, and, and our intention to the market is to make financing transparent, uh, understandable, and remove the, under, remove the sense of, of being predatory from the equation so that people can have a trusted financial partner that solves their liquidity needs. Um, for us, this means that we charge a fixed discount over the entire amount of rent that's going to be collected. And we kind of bake in those human time bills and uh, origination fees and, and technology fees all into this price so that person sees exactly the amount of money that they're going to get minus everything and there's no surprises um, but it's look it's it's, it's a not it's not a cheap process to run um, financial process in, in Latin America of course is reflected in this in their interest rates and pricing we're going to the market trying to be as competitive as we can but um, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's certainly still a market which faces systemic illiquidity and as a result is reflected in pricing from, from central banks and, and from fintechs such as ourselves. I love it. We're bringing liquidity to LATAM. It's the mission. Dude, I, I got to ask, have you ever had someone apply for the loan and then you just find out that it's not the guy? It's just like some guy? Dude, totally. Like, <laughs> totally. This, oh my God. When we started the out and we're just focused on residential, I, I don't even know how many times this has happened. There's so many people in, in the world that are credit seeking and they're in a they're in a place of desperation. They need capital for whatever, or or maybe they're looking for adverse reasons, but they go on and they apply and they have no lease. They're uploading like pictures with a smiley face in place of a of a lease agreement. And uh, you know, their credit score is coming back in a in in a very weak position. And you know, it's evident that they're trying to defraud you. So yes, often um, we've set up systems in place to ensure that these are caught and that these people don't move through the pipeline to receive capital, um, but certainly have seen it. Um, you'd be surprised to what lengths people will go through from forging documents to just trying to jam an application through a, a digital portal. They've, they've done it all. <laughs> you know, certainly... Certainly, uh, yeah, na nature of the industry, if you will. You, you, you do see a bit of crazy stuff. <laughs> I love it. It's like one day it's like, oh, yeah, we got a new deal, avocado farm, blah, blah, blah. You come back, it, you you meet up the next day at the water cooler. Yeah, so what happened to that av avocado farm? It's like, oh, it's not that guy. It's just like some guy. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. It's, it's hysterical, man. Like, just the, the extent that people will go to, you know, thankfully we've got – 
a brilliant data science lead who's you know, <laughs> Sorry, I'm still lead. laughing. I'm sure you do. <laughs> no, totally, Just, man. It's it's insane. Like I've I've literally have received PDFs of smiley faces in place of bank statements and property deeds trying to apply for financing. And it's like, what like what 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 do you expect to happen here, my friend? Like, no, I'm not gonna give you money. It's uh it's insane. But hey man, you know, it's the nature of the beast. Um you know, in turn, it, it, it propelled us to move into what I believe is the right direction, looking to work more with businesses and, and more more formalized entities and has really um, ha- has really grown my my level of impression for people who are working with this informal industry to have managed to bring in technology to it because it's something which I can't do. It's something which is beyond my level of understanding and, uh, you know, certainly very impressed with the, the founders and, and CEOs who are able to do it. That's awesome. Uh, just just one or two more things before I let you go. H- have you learned a lot about the credit score system in Mexico? Even me, I spent a lot of time in Mexico, but I don't know much about how kind of credit scores work. Do you have a, a behind the scenes view into that through the nature of your business? Totally, man. Yeah, happy to help here. Um, so there's two systems here in Mexico um, that are kind of like standardized. Uh, many fintechs have their own algorithms. Um Shout out Altscore, building a, a, a very interesting non-standardized data uh, data model to, to help alternative access to credit. But the, the two main ones are called FICO, uh, which is very similar to what we have in the United States, and Bureau de Credito. Um, FICO is a product distributed by primarily Circulo de Credito uh, through an API, uh, which gives a very robust understanding of credit. Uh, and Bureau de Credito is a product which I believe was created by a number of banks in order to help score risk. Um, it's what we use in, in our model in order to understand uh, morosity and risk associated with crediting decisions. Um, there's generally a 40 to 50 point offset between the two. Um, FICO is typically a little bit lower, uh, but of course, each of them have their own algorithms and, and morosity tables to understand um, and, and are quite unique. So I would encourage anyone building a fintech to, to evaluate those closely and understand which one would fit you best. But uh, you know, generally speaking, like, um, you know, a, a 700 Bureau de Credito here, it's similar to what you'd see in your FICO report in the United States. Um, everyone has one. Um, it's important that people care for them. There's certainly a lot of neglect um, in an informal ecosystem like we have in Latin America. And um, we're seeing the rise now of products to help consumers. Uh, Zenfi just raised a eight, eight and a half million dollar seed round um, to do this. They have an amazing product to to enable Mexicans to monitor their credit. And uh, we're starting to see a few others kind of emerge as well to bring a better understanding and control of credit. And so is the FICO or FICO, is that is it literally kind of the same company as the States or it just happens to the same uh, same acronym? My understanding is that it's from, uh, it's from the same algorithm. Um, that being said, I don't believe I've ever asked ChatGPT this. So it would be a, a good exercise to do. Um, but... Uh, yet my understanding is it's, it's the same algorithm of financial markers that's being utilized in order to understand risk. Got it. And do do most Mexicans or does every Mexican have a credit score or only once they start kind of op- opening bank accounts and accessing credit? Yeah, my understanding is that the credit score is tied to the uh, equivalent of a social security number. Uh, the RUC? Uh, no, the, the other one. The RFC. RC, uh, okay, yeah. Reg- Registro Federal Contribuentes, I believe, is, yeah, is the yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, that being said, if a user does not have um, financial history, a credit account, a bank account, anything of this nature, there would be no, no score able to be delivered. So um, it's not uncommon uh, to see this, especially with businesses. Uh, young businesses often don't have any sort of rating. Um, but after two to three years of history, certainly, you know, you start to see scoring developed and uh, a little bit of risk being able to be understood. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so for the digital nomads out there and, and people that are kind of just getting their RFCs for the first time, do you think you'd have a credit score just by virtue of having an RFC and a bank account? Or you'd have to kind of get some activity going there, maybe get a first uh, credit card or how could someone... How could someone avoid getting into the system and then, or how could someone, you know, make sure that they do get in and start, you know, building good credit? um, 
to avoid getting into the system, uh, don't get an RFC. Uh, don't don't become a resident. But of course, you know if you're doing any sort of uh, economic activity in the country that you're looking to operate in and live in, and are considering a, a place of home, it's important you do take that step and formalize your residency in order to um, have protected rights and and an economic situation there. Um, once you are a resident, a permanent or temporary, um, you will have a, a record within these credit systems, but you won't have any sort of history given that you don't have any financial products or, or lending history. So uh, for me, what I did to get started, I went out, I got a phone line um, with Tell, uh, sorry, Tell Cell. Um, this somehow appeared on my credit report as like a, an installment payment of uh, I think 2,000 pesos, 100 bucks a month and started to build my credit. I then took that credit history and I got a credit card with New Bank and then with Rappi Card. And um, when you are able to continue utilizing your balance and making timely payments and making smart decisions, you can build your score up in a pretty easy way. And then once you have a little bit of history, a year, two years, you have employment history, you can start to look at more complicated financial products, whether personal loans or whether mortgages, uh, they will become available to you. Good, good tips, guys. Listen to Joe. <laughs> awesome, yeah. man. Um, yeah, that Rappi card, get that unlimited <laughs> free, so <laughs> fee free Rappi. It's amazing. Yeah, Rappi, the Rappi card's a. Uh, it's, I mean, all of these credit cards are very expensive. Um, I think the average rates you're looking at are around 60 to 70% APR. Woo! And Get into I, that market, buddy. I, I mean, man, like, <laughs> if we're talking about lucrative financial products, the credit card market in Mexico is certainly near the top. I've, I've seen up to 125 uh, from a bank issuing the credit card. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty wild. Um, but again, you know, that... That type of financial ecosystems, that's, that's what inspired me to be here. It's insane. If you Dude, don't- I didn't even have a chance to ask you about how Mexicans have a crazy relationship with debt that's very different Dude, it's than insane. Americans. I guess that's probably another rabbit hole, though. <laughs> I mean, dude, like if you look, yeah, going back to mortgages we talked about, there's like a less than 20% penetration rate of the mortgage. Everyone's in cash. No one wants to pay these interests. If you go get a credit card, you're paying 70, 60, 70, 80%, 125%, something crazy. Personal loan products. There's things I've seen up to 440 percent APR. Like it's it's just insane. So being able to bring fair capital to people that they understand, that they're not surprised by, that they know what they're getting into, makes you feel good at the end of the day. So you know, really trying to push this into uh, into the mainstream and and try to extend financing to more individuals and, and really help them access. The next chapter of their lives that they need to get towards. Joe Marullo, uh, any uh, final words for the audience? Please take this time, Joe, to just uh, direct the audience to anything you want to tell them about and, and share your message. Well, um, thanks again for the opportunity, man. Really enjoyed speaking with you. Um, great podcast. I, I suggest everyone go out there, follow my Latin life. Um, if you're building something in Latin America and want feedback, would be happy to chat. Uh, hit me up on Twitter. It's Marulo, M-E-R-U-L-L-O, Joe. Um, and yeah, I'll see you all there. Awesome. Well, this has been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast. Again, my guest today has been Joe Marulo, CEO of Arenda, Mexico City-based fintech startup. Joe, thanks again for joining us.